Hello all of my history loving friends. I'm here in Coffeyville, Kansas at the side of the Condon Bank. Coffeyville was basically the last hurrah of the Dalton gang. There were three Dalton brothers in this gang. Grat, Emmett, and Bob. Bob was in charge. He wasn't the oldest, but he was smart and Grat is described as being dumber than a box of rocks. They were related to the Youngers. Their mother was a Younger and they wanted to live up to the legacy of the Younger Brothers. Their idea was let's do something more amazing than they did. Now usually they knocked off trains or stole horses. They started off stealing horses and escalated from there. This day they decide they're going to rob two banks at the same time. The Condon, which is located right here, and the First National, which was at now this parking lot right here. This building is Isham's Hardware Store. It was there that day. It was owned by Henry Isham. He had a huge inventory of guns and ammunition. The thing about Coffeyville and what's interesting that they chose this town is they were from here. The Dalton family had lived here for around six years. They hadn't lived here for the last two, but anyone who had lived in Coffeyville for any amount of time knew the Dalton family. The way they hoped to keep from being recognized was to wear false beards. On paper, the plan sounded pretty good. There were five members of the gang. There was brothers, there was Bob, Grat, and Emmett. Then they had two other associates, Bill Powers and Richard Broadwell. Grat, Bill, and Richard would rob the Condon. At the same time, Emmett and Bob would go in the First National. They camped outside town the night before, on October 4th, 1892. They did not go into town to scope it out to see if anything had changed. Bob was so confident that the plan would work perfectly that he didn't feel it necessary. Something interesting about the Dalton brothers is they started out as lawmen. There were 15 Daltons in the family, 13 of whom grew into adulthood. And most of them lived good law-abiding lives. This is the grave of Frank Dalton. Frank was the older brother and they really revered him and he was a very well-respected lawman. He was killed in the line of duty in 1888. He was 28 years old. For a while, the brothers tried to live up to his legacy. Why did they go bad? Bob said it was because the pay was so crappy. And there is a lot of truth to that. They did not have a salary. They would get $2 for each arrest. If you had to bring somebody in, say a great distance, anything you spent to feed them, clothe them, etc., came right out of the marshal's pocket. The Daltons, all three had been marshals, began supplementing their income by selling hooch to the American Indian tribes in the area. Bob wanted more. He wanted fame, fortune, women. When he was caught selling this hooch, he lost his badge. And that's when they all just went to the dark side. At this time, on October 4th, 1892, the night before the job, a posse led by Heck Thomas was right on their tail, less than 24 hours behind them. These two banks right beside each other seemed like a great opportunity to hit it really big and then just disappear. They rode into town via 8th Street. Imagine those five riders riding down the street and they were headed for this intersection where I'm standing right now at 8th and Walnut. This is where they planned to tie up their horses. There was a hitching post that the Daltons knew about. And as you can see, it was a great location. Here is the Condon, and that right there is Isham's and the First National. I'm gonna take a minute and tell you a little bit about what some other people were doing. I mean, it's 9.30 in the morning. The streets are full of people bustling about. And Saturday is 
Dalton days. And so they have these storefronts set up for that. George Cubine, his family was famous for inventing shoes that fit each foot. And I'm gonna show you exactly where his store was. So we're going by Isham's. This is the same building that was there that day. It has changed a little bit. It's still in operation as a hardware store. It's the oldest operating hardware store in Kansas. First National was located right next door. In 1892, I would be inside the First National Bank. Couple of businesses between First National and Cubine's Boot Shop, and it would have been somewhere where I am right now. If you wanted to buy shoes in 1892, I would have recommended buying them from Mr. Cubine because they would have fit your right and your left foot. People would order boots from Mr. Cubine from all over the country. He was running his store that morning. Charles Brown, who would also step up to defend the town, he used to work for Mr. Cubine. So he was also a shoemaker, but I'm not sure what he was doing at the time. But he had to have been in this general vicinity. The marshal, Charlie Connolly, was a teacher. He was just, he was near here. I'm not sure exactly where. He would soon become a school principal. Being the marshal was not his main job. It was just something he did on the side. Like I said, for the $2 for each arrest. He, like everybody else, had to find a weapon once all of this started happening. Another person who's going to be very important this day is John Clare. Claire had a livery and it was located in Death Alley. Before all of this happened, he just curled up and took a nap. John Claire was an excellent shot. There were a lot of Civil War veterans in Coffeyville at this time. Even though people were not carrying guns, they all knew how to use them. The guys ride in and they come here to find that this street is being paved. They're putting in gutter, they're putting in sidewalk, and the hitching posts are gone. They're gonna have to put their horses somewhere else. Bob makes a decision that in hindsight probably isn't the best. I'm continuing down 8th toward what would be known as Death Alley. They put their horses at the very end of it. But at the time, it felt like an okay decision. So let me show you where he ended up putting them. Now in 1892, the alley wasn't quite as narrow, or it doesn't appear to be in the photographs from right after all of this happened, as it is now. We do have to keep that in mind when we are criticizing Bob for the decisions that he made. Coffeyville, since they had lived there, had doubled in size. And one of the reasons they were robbing it in early October is because farmers had recently brought in the harvest. Banks would be full. There was no FDIC. Anything they stole, the people who had their money in the bank just lost it, which is probably one reason they fought so darn hard against this robbery. I'm here at the extreme end of Death Alley. The end of this alley, you can see Isham's hardware from here. Somewhere along here was a fence. They took their five horses and they hooked them to that fence. It wasn't a hitching post, it wasn't a pipe, it was a fence. After hooking the horses up, they all turn and walk all the way down this alley toward the bank. All five of the guys were very well armed. Every single one carried a Winchester. Bob also had a pearl-handled Colt. He had another Colt in his boot and a British Bulldog in his vest. Emmett also had two Colts. I think most of the guys had two Colts. As they come out here, right here on the corner was the McKenna and Adamson store. Al McKenna was standing right here sweeping the sidewalk and he saw the guys walk by and he recognized the Dalton brothers. Immediately he is pretty suspicious. Now the guys were openly carrying guns and no one in Coffeyville 
carried guns. However, it was hunting season. So carrying a rifle around like that really wasn't all that odd that time of season. But the Daltons had a reputation. So Al slips in behind them and follows them. Bill, Richard, and Grat go into the Condon. And he just kind of holds back and he doesn't really notice as Emmett and Bob split off and head across the street toward the First National. He's very focused on what's going on here. And he's able to see, these windows are very open with a great view of what's going on inside. And he, he can easily tell as they start to rob this bank. Grat, Bill, and Richard came in these doors. They would have put a gun in the face of the teller standing right here, and they would have demanded cash. The teller decided to tell Grat, who, like I said, was an idiot. I can't open the safe because it's on a time lock. It won't open for 10 or 15 more minutes. And Grat is sitting here thinking, oh, God, what do I do? He's not very good at thinking on his feet. So instead of questioning what the teller has just told him, he says, we'll wait. Meanwhile, a couple of more customers come in and they take them hostage. I'm gonna guess that maybe they went around this way into this door to confront the teller, made him come over this way to the safe. This isn't the original safe. The, the original door is in the museum next door. That was found in a farmer's field. They had filled the bottom with concrete and were using it as an animal trough. There was $40,000 in this safe that the guys never got their hands on because they're standing outside these doors like dummies just waiting for something to unlock that's never going to. And while they're doing that, all the citizens outside are getting mobilized. So when Mr. McKenna sees them robbing the bank, he immediately comes here to Isham's hardware store and he runs inside and he tells Henry Isham and anyone who is there as a customer, the Daltons are here and they're robbing the bank. And Henry Isham starts handing out guns and ammunition and anybody who's willing to stand up and stop this robbery, he gives them a gun. It's part of his inventory of his store. There's another hardware store nearby who starts doing the same thing, but Isham's will become the center of the resistance to the Daltons and stopping them. The estimate is that the citizens of Coffeyville were armed within five minutes of realizing what was going on at the bank. Nobody knows what's going on in the First National. Let me tell you what's going on in there. Bob and Emmett burst through the doors. Here you can see the doors. When the building started burning in 1895, someone came up and removed the doors before they could burn. And they're now in the Dalton Defenders Museum. But they come through these doors and they walk up to the teller. His name was Tom Ayers. Tom does what he can to resist. They demand all of the, the money. Basically, the staff of the First National move as slowly as they can. Let's just delay them. It really starts to make Bob pretty ticked off. Eventually, he does get his hands on about $20,000 from the First National. He's got it in his bag. They take several people hostage and they come up to the front doors of the First National. They push the hostages outside and as they come out, the shooting starts. It's the first time they know anything is, has gone wrong. Bob wounds a citizen, immediately comes back inside the bank and decides I'm going to have to go out the back. It's not part of the plan, but it's what they're going to have to do. Now I don't know if Lucius Baldwin knew all of this was going on or not, but as Bob and Emmett and the hostages are moving out this way, Lucius is, has the misfortune of meeting them somewhere within this area here. He's got a gun on his hip, so that makes me think he was on his way to defend the banks. 
and Bob yells at him to stop and Lucius evidently doesn't hear him and he doesn't know who he has just run into as he sees them he instinctively puts his hand on his gun Bob says something to the effect of I've got to have that man shoots him and Lucius Baldwin is the first citizen to die that day the guys turn left and they start heading this direction come to the end of all of the buildings and then they turn left on 8th Street and they're gonna ro walk right by where they were supposed to originally have left their horses now most of the people that defend are located on either side of Isham's hardware store most defenders are focusing exclusively on the Condon. They're not really sure where Bob and Emmett have gone. And for a while, Bob and Emmett have it a whole lot better than their counterparts. Approximately right here is where the Opera House was. And it's from here that Bob has a view of Isham's and he sees George Cubine and Charles Brown. They have their back to him. And you can see here about how far away it was. It was a pretty good shot, actually. He was at the corner of the Opera House here on 8th Street when he shot George Cubine in the back. Charles Brown tried to reach for George Cubine's weapon, but Bob shot him before he really even had a chance to respond. And they had their attention on the Condon. They had no idea that Bob and Emmett were behind them like this. Once Emmett and Bob come out of the other bank, they start firing not only at them, but they start firing here as well. When that starts happening, of course, Grat grabs what cash he can, realizes they've got to get out of here. As the Condon is being shot up, Bill Powers gets hit. And he's, he's saying, oh God, I've been hit. We gotta get out of here. And so they grab what they can. The air would have been full of smoke from the guns going off. This building is being pockmarked with bullets. The windows are being shot out. But there wouldn't have been a whole lot of fly, or flying glass because the windows were designed to not shatter. And they fulfilled their purpose. They grab the cash. They go through these doors and head for the alley. Here, I'm gonna show you where George Hubine and Charles Brown were killed. It looks like they probably came out of their store and they were standing here right beside Isham's. Someone else who gets hit is Tom Ayers, the teller from the First National. He comes out and one of the guys over here shoots him in the face. Now he takes a bullet under his left eye and it went all the way through his head. I have no idea how he survived. Another defender came up to him and put his thumb either on the wound or maybe even in it and stopped the bleeding enough that he saved Tom Ayer's life. But Henry Isham, he goes downstairs to the basement of the hardware store and it was very different this was lower so that there was actually a little window that looked into the basement of the hardware store and Henry placed himself on this side of the building made himself a little sniper's nest shooting straight at the Condon as you can see he had a perfect shot of the guys as they came out of the Condon and his descendants claim that he hit all three of the bandits who had no idea where they were being shot from. As the guys come out, there's a guy in one of these upstairs windows shooting at them. I believe this one because he would have had the best shot as they ran toward the alley. He hits Bill Powers again. He's now been shot twice. Grat is also hit. And by the time they get to the alley, all three of them have all been shot. The sound of the shooting wakes up John Clare. Another defender, Carrie, he was the town barber. 
he actually had a gun handy in his wagon because he had just come back from hunting. He had a double barreled shotgun immediately. He joins Claire at his stables and they go through the stables of the livery to cut off the bandits. Meanwhile, Sheriff Connolly also heads to cut them off. He goes the opposite direction through a vacant lot. The first person to die in the alley was Bill Powers. He tried to take refuge in a building and the door was locked and they shot him down. As a marshal came in through here, he met the bandits entering the alley. Grat saw the marshal and killed him. This would have been open then. This would have been where the stables were. And that is the direction that and Claire went. And they came through here they must have been a little behind the, the marshal because he was able, after Grat shot the marshal, John Clare caught Grat in the throat as Grat turned to look at him. And it actually broke Grat's neck. By some miracle, Broadwell made it to his horse. He was severely wounded, however, and his body was found two miles outside of town, and his horse, the only horse to survive, was found in Indian Territory. The whole time they're going down 8th Street like this, they are basically not being harassed at all. And if they had changed their minds and not tried to meet the other guys, I think they might have got away. But instead, they decided to stick to the plan. Instead of going all the way down and around the block to the end of the alley where the horses were tied, they instead took this shortcut into the alley where they were met by Carrie and John Clare. Clare shot Bob right in the chest. Bob fell to the ground. Emmett manages to get to his horse but when he sees what has happened to his brother he turns around and he tries to come back and help him and bob tells him i'm done for you need to just get out of here but then catches him with a shotgun right in the back and he falls off his horse too and is it totally incapacitated as emmett falls everybody's down with everything over Emmett on the ground, the shooting stops. The people of Coffeeville took a collective sigh of relief. Because this has turned out to be pretty long, I'm going to talk about the aftermath, the loss the town suffered, but also the way that they now honor the men who stood up and defended Coffeeville in the next video. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you liked what you saw here today, please like this video and please subscribe to my channel. If you made it to the end, then you will really enjoy all of the content I make here. I'll see you next time. As a note though, this is a reissuing of this episode. It was age restricted. Since there was absolutely nothing inappropriate in this video, I have to guess that it was triggered by the names of Richard Broadwell and Carrie, which I'm not going to say because I don't want to get age restricted again. It's extremely disrespectful to this heroic man who was a defender of Coffeeville to bleep his name. I am so sorry about that. All I can say is YouTube is absolutely ridiculous. There is no way to appeal an age restriction and actually get a human being to look at it. They just let their computer run it again. They hear the same 
words that sound dirty to them but are actually not at all in any way and age restricted again which means they completely hide it from your audience suppressing it in the algorithm so that nobody ever sees it age restriction is so much more insidious than just demonetizing a video because when it's age restricted it's literally hidden from people and you can't even get sponsors or anything to make up for that it's soul crushing demonetization you can deal with age restriction and hiding it from people is so much worse and people get mad at me the creator for censoring stuff when it is literally not me i have to do what they make me do that's all there is to it it stinks it's awful it's wrong when you're dealing with historical content and educational documentaries in so many ways. I literally could shake with anger, but there's nothing I can do about it. And if I want my stuff to get out to an audience, I just have to toe the line like a good little girl and do what they tell me. But that's also the problem. They don't tell you why they've age restricted it. So you just have to guess. So again, I'm guessing I could put this out again and they could age restrict it in instantly after I upload it again. I don't know. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Sorry about the weird editing. It's stupid, but I have to do it. So I will see you next time. Love all of you. <laughs>